and she has many publications to her credit in both the national and international journals. She actively participates in many of the health awareness campaigns uh, for women and adolescent girls and her field, uh, field of interest is high risk pregnancy, gynecology ultrasound and gynecological endoscopy. Now I request Madam to take over.
it increases the synthesis of thyroid binding globulin because this T4 is bound to thyroid binding globulin and thereby it is always in bound form whereas the active form T3 is going to be entering the cells. So we note here that estrogen has a positive feedback over the pituitary one and here it increases the synthesis of binding globulin and thereby increases the total T4 in blood and reduces the circulating free T4. To see into the thyroid hormone synthesis, not much in detail, but two things I wanted to note here is that the iodine trapping, that is the iodine which is absorbed from small intestine, is trapped into the thyroid gland for synthesis of thyroid by thyroid stimulating hormone. And here, the various steps of thyroid synthesis we have which is oxidation, organification, coupling, endocytosis, all these things, peroxidase enzyme. And again the release of hormones, that is T3, thyroidine and T4, the thyroxin into circulation back from the thyroid gland is in the presence of thyroid stimulating hormone. These two are very important because when we have antibody formation, that is we have thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody, and we have peroxidase antibody. When you have antibodies against this receptor and this enzyme, we are going to have trouble. So we need to know this. Now we are going to go through various age groups in women and how this thyroid is going to affect them. Adolescents, this is the age group, somewhere between the age of 10 to 19. The transition between childhood and adulthood. We tell that a girl has attained puberty. What is this puberty? It is only the onset of menstruation? No. It is a sequence of changes which occurs in girls starting from the age of 6 to 7 to the age of 10 to 11. Over the past, over this period of 4 to 5 years, we have various changes occurring in them where we have adrenal glands coming in, producing adrenarche, producing steroids which produces plebarche that is the onset of secondary sexual characters then we have the breast growth which is called telarche and we have a very very important thing there is a growth spurt there is increase in height in females which is about the, they, reach, they, they reach their peak height compared to the boys two years prior to them this peak velocity growth is very important they increase in height as well as weight then finally we have the onset of menstruation that is called NRK. So when do we when we tell that is till the age of 15, 16, or till they, we wait till 18 also, provided the secondary sexual characters are formed and they have not attained NRK, then we tell that there is a delay in puberty. So when there is a decrease in this growth velocity, we expect the girls to increase 5 cm per year from the age of 4. That is the growth <coughs> velocity we expect. So this decreased growth velocity or a delayed bone age or short stature associated with absence of menstruation or onset of menstruation that is delayed puberty, we should think of hypothyroidism. There are other causes, growth hormone deficiency and other things. But here, with all this decreased growth velocity, decreased growth age, short stature, it's more likely due to hypothyroidism. Then we have secondary amenorrhea. That is, the girl has attained menarche, but over the next few years, she did not get her periods regularly over a period of three months, four months, six months, and so on. This is called secondary amenorrhea. Again, hypothyroidism comes in, thyroid hormone deficiency could be there. Then we have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Every one of us have heard about it. Girls, young girls present with irregular periods, gain in weight, and a lot of skin changes and other things with ultrasound features coming to us with polycystic ovarian syndrome. We cannot brand them as a polycystic ovarian syndrome until we have ruled out hyperthyroidism because deficiency in thyroid hormone itself can cause all the symptoms which you are talking about. So we have to rule out hypothyroidism and we have to correct hypothyroidism before we brand a girl with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Next, a girl gets married. 
the reproductive age group. She has to conceive. Any girl who gets married is expected to conceive within a year. If she doesn't conceive within a year, then we tell the girl is subfertile. Is there any hormonal changes due to hypothyroid causing problems? Yes. We have increase in, in hypothyroidism. We have increase in paratrophic releasing hormone. When TRH increases immediately, TSH and prolactin increase together. So when we have hyperprolactinemia, it acts on the ovaries, adrenals, liver, pancreas, causing various changes, finally leading to hyperandrogenism. Similarly, there is altered GnRH pulsatile secretion, leading to decreased FSH action and increase in LH delay in LH response, leading to impaired follicular genesis and inadequate corpus luteum. Thereby, there is difficulty in conceiving. And even if they conceive, we do have pregnancy-related complications like early miscarriages. So, so, this is treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism necessary in subfertility? Yes. Because they are associated with very early miscarriages, mostly goes unnoticed. So, definitely it requires correction. So, when TSH, that is thyroid stimulating hormone, is more than 4, we definitely treat them. If TSH is between 2.4 and 4, and they go for high order reproductive techniques like ICSI or IVF, that is test tube baby. We have to treat them. You know why? Because there's a lot of hormones, lot, lot of estrogen being given this time during the treatment. So increase in estrogen, we have known that increase in thyroid blinding globulin and thereby the bone forms are more, circulating T4 is less. So TSH is going to be high and then we lead into hypothyroidism. So definitely subclinical hypothyroidism has to be treated in women going in for higher order reproductive techniques. And we talked about peroxidase enzyme. Particularly, we talked about it because we have thyroid peroxidase antibody. When they are positive for thyroid peroxidase antibody, they definitely have problems conceiving and they have a lot of pregnancy complications. So, when it is between 2.5 and 4, with thyroid peroxidase antibody, we have to treat them definitely. If it is going to be 2.5 to 4 and they are negative, thyroid peroxidase antibody negative, are we going to treat them? It is controversial according to the guidelines. But as a practitioner, we would still treat because we do not want to have adverse pregnancy outcomes. Now, we go into pregnancy. She has conceived how much of trouble she is going to face. <coughs> it is the most common endocrine disorder in pregnancy. About 1 to 2 percent of pregnant women are affected. Subclinical hypothyroidism again comes in. It is more common. It's about 2 percent. And overt hypothyroidism is 0.05 percent. Hyperthyroidism, not very common. Generally, hyperthyroid women, when they conceive, we see such patients. But generally, after pregnancy comes in, or at the onset of pregnancy, we do not have hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism is more common. But postpartum thyroiditis is common. It is about 5 to 10 percent, especially when they are antibody positive. Thyroid peroxidase antibody positive, they have postpartum thyroiditis. So, it is very essential that we screen all pregnant women. Screening, definitely necessary. At the first visit when the woman comes with pregnancy positive, we have to investigate her, see if she is subclinically hypothyroid or hypothyroid, initiate the treatment immediately. That is very, very essential. <coughs> So these are the physiological changes in pregnancy. As we all know, human chorionic gonadotrophin just peaks up in the first trimester. You know that is the cause for the urine pregnancy test being positive, or we see that beta HCG in blood. And this HCG has got cross reactivity with TSH receptors. So what happens is that HCG competes with TSH for its receptors, and thereby immediately T4 increases. It is nature's way of doing it. What happens is that in the first trimester, the baby is at the, I mean the fetus is not competent enough to produce its own thyroid hormones for its growth, mainly the brain growth. So, HCG increases in the first trimester, 
With cross-reactivity with TSH, it increases the free T4 in blood transiently in the first trimester to enable the transplacental transfer to the fetus in order to help the fetus with the iodine and the thyroxine requirement because the baby, the fetus cannot form its thyroid hormone in the first trimester and it is very essential. Thyroid hormone is very essential for the neurocognitive development and the brain development of the fetus in the first trimester onwards. And we have seen the estrogen definitely increases in the pregnancy and with estrogen increasing, the binding globulin increases, so the total T4 goes up. Then, when we see this, in pregnancy what happens is that there is increased basal metabolic rate. Not only because of the mothers, but it is also because of the fetal metabolism. There is thyroid gland hyperplasia <coughs> to uh, I mean, fulfill the demands of the hormone requirement and along with this, uh, along with the production, there is also increased iodine clearance, glomerular filtration rate increases, the, the renal excretion of the iodine increases and transplacental transfer to the baby occurs and there is placental dehydration of T4 also. So what happens, the impact is, if the patient is Iodine sufficient, she may be maintaining herself new thyroid. If her thyroid reserves are good, she may be maintaining herself. But if she is going to be iron deficient, then there is relative iron deficiency with risk of fetal and maternal hypothyroidism coming in. So placental deiodination occurs, T4 is excreted. There needs to be production of reverse T3. I think I did tell about reverse T3. Uh, that is T3 is the active form and reverse T3 is the inactive form which is present. And this reverse T3 in blood increases when there is reduction in the metabolism. Like when the patient is having fever, the patient is having like some sort of disease, she is not able to be mobile, burns, injuries, post-operative state. When the metabolic rate in decreases that time, the reverse T3 <coughs> increases. So similarly, this reverse T3 increases during pregnancy and thereby the active T3 is less. So in order to produce this reverse T3, and the T4 level has to increase and there is increased production, need of increased production in pregnancy. Then of course we have in, uh, estrogen induced thyroid banding globulin increases, so total T3, T4 increases. Then first trimester HCG is high and thereby mild thyrotoxicosis T4 <coughs> coming in more and thereby TSH is less. In second and third trimester the placenta takes over, so the placental dehydration is there, the placental transfer is there and thereby the thyroid hormone is less and TSH goes up and there is mild hypothyroidism in the second and the third trimester. So our cutoff values for the thyroid hormone normalcy differs according to the trimester. There is trimester specific variation in the cutoff values for thyroid hormones. Then, like I was telling you about the antibodies, this thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody, I told you when they are positive, they have problem like Graves disease, uh, they have problems like postpartum thyroiditis. But generally in pregnancy, immunity goes down. So, even autoimmune disorders sometimes become present during pregnancy. So grave disease improvement is there during pregnancy. But once the delivery is over, postpartum increase in thyroid antibody occurs and there is postpartum thyroiditis. So grave disease exacerbation occurs. These are the normal changes and the impact which can occur due to the thyroid physiology. So about the iodine. We were talking about the iodine requirement. Nearly 30 countries remain iodine deficient world over. Maternal iodine supplementation in areas of iodine deficiency is very important to improve the cognitive performance, that is the neurocognitive development in the fetus. And there is reduced stillbirth, neonatal infant mortality. I told the pregnancy adverse outcomes can be prevented with iodine supplementation. So the recommended iodine intake will be 150 micrograms per day preconceptionally and 250 micrograms per day in pregnant and lactating women. In low resource settings, single annual dose of 400 milligrams of iodine <coughs> oil for pregnant women is recommended. Then we have natural dietary factors like anything from sea, seafood, sea salt, then cranberries, strawberries, fennel, 
broccoli, coconut oil, watercress, seaweeds, all these things are rich in iodine which we can recommend for our patients. <coughs> now going into the various types of problems. We have clinical hypothyroidism, I told is the most important, most common one. There is increased TSH with normal 3T3 and T4. I told you the cutoffs are different because of the varying hormonal changes which occurs in the first trimester, second and third. So we have TSH reference value of 0.1 to 2.5. Second trimester is 0.2 to 3. Third trimester is 0.3 to 3. A subclinical hypothyroidism itself causes pregnancy loss, preterm birth, abruption. So it's very essential that subclinical hypothyroidism is diagnosed at the onset of pregnancy and the treatment is initiated in the first trimester to prevent all this pregnancy complications and to improve the baby's neurocognitive performance. Overt hypothyroidism is increased TSH with low free T4. TSH is more than 10 mini international units. Despite normal free T4, then we call they are over. Again, there is increased pregnancy loss, preterm delivery, preeclampsia, decrease in intelligence in the children in presence of over hypothyroidism. Autoantibodies, as you have already discussed, they are antithyroid antibodies which are antithyroperoxidase, that is called PPO. An antithyroglobulin antibody are present in 2 to 7, or 17 percent of pregnant women. It is associated with increased risk of miscarriage, preterm delivery, IUGR, PIH and stillbirth. And it has been linked to the increased risk of postpartum thyroiditis, which I have already told, and neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. And importantly, when they are thyroid peroxidase antibody, even if they are subclinical hypothyroid during pregnancy, they progress to overt hypothyroidism at the rate of 20% per year in the next few years. <coughs> So with this, the American thyroid guidelines are instituted where we check the TSH as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed and thyroid peroxidase antibody is done if it is between 2.5 to 10. TSH if it is less than 0.1, they are going to be thyrotoxicosis, so we are not going to deal it here. If it is TSH is more than 10, they are over hypothyroid, definitely we are going to treat them. If it is going to be between 0.1 to 2.5, yes, definitely we are going to treat, leave them alone. TSH is 2.5 to 10, then we go according to the positivity of the antibody. If the thyroid peroxidase antibody positive and TSH is between 2.5 to upper limit of reference rate that is 4, we consider treatment. If it is going to be between 4 and 10, definitely we treat them with thyroxin. Then we have TSH 2.5 to with thyroid peroxidase antibody negative, no treatment recommended. Thyroid peroxidase antibody negative between 4 and 10, we will consider treatment. This is the recommendation. So how are we going to treat the women? It's going to be liver peroxin sodium. It's available as 25 to 300 microgram dosages. Adverse effects will be transient hair loss, decreased bone mineral density in the mother. Low birth weight and decreased head circumference in the baby when they are given in excess. Drug interactions, I want you all to know about it definitely because in pregnancy, iron, calcium and antacids are the most common medications they receive. Thyroxin have drug interaction with them, they interfere with their absorption. So we have to be very careful with the medications and that way we do not give any one of them concurrently with thyroxin. And most of the time it is given in empty stomach in the mornings. If the patient is on other drugs like phenytoin or carbamazepine or rifampicin that is anti-tuberculous or anti-coagulants or anti-convulsants, all of these drugs are going to interact with thyroxin and we have to be careful when we are going to give it along with these medications in deciding the dosage of thyroxin for the mother. So how to initiate treatment? If they are already on levothyroxine, liv increase the dosage by 20 to 30 percent. You know when? When the pregnancy test is positive. Please do not wait for the lab TSH to come. Definitely within 4-5 weeks when they come and see you with urine pregnancy test positive, immediately increase the thyroxine level by 30 percent because of the already discussed. They require, their requirement increases. And for those newly diagnosed, it will be about 1 to 2 micrograms per kilogram per day. We will actually keep it as 1.5 micrograms per kilogram per day and start the treatment. 
And we rechecked DSH in four weeks and adjusted in 25 to 50 micrograms increments as necessary. When to stop the we, we return to the pre-pregnancy dosage after delivery and we check TSH at six weeks postpartum. Those who were newly treated in pregnancy, if they are receiving somewhere less than 50, 25, we can stop it. They will not require it further. So the goal of the TSH value will be to bring it below 2.5 million international units per ml. Monitoring will be every monthly until we stabilize them until mid-pregnancy and at least once near 30 weeks of gestation. We actually, practically what we do is first trimester, we finish once, stabilize them. Second trimester and third trimester, once we check so that we just make sure the requirement, what we are giving is enough. <coughs> now we go on to hyperthyroidism in pregnancy. As I told you, it's not very commonly seen as hypothyroid. So if it is going to be TSH is low and FT4 and FT3 is high, that is going to be overt. Decreased TSH and normal FT3, FT4 is going to be subclinical. Gestational is detected in pregnancy, except for that transient thyrotoxicosis, which we see in the first trimester, we don't see so commonly. Symptoms, we know, palmar erythema, emotional lability, vomiting, goiter, heat intolerance, exophthalmos, and failure to gain weight. Very common in the first trimester. It can be due to hyperemesis per se. And increased the thyroxine in the first trimester also causes the same symptoms, and so it is really confusing. So cross-reactivity between HCG and TSH receptor levels, they are generally thyroid receptor, hormone receptor, antibody negative. So the same symptoms occur, but the no need to give any anti-thyroid medication, spontaneous dissolution by 18 week occurs because it's just the hormonal and but the, by the beginning of the second trimester, everything sets right on its own. Suppose if they are hyperthyroid and they have become pregnant or they are planning to become pregnant. The thionamide group of drugs, generally methimazole is the first drug of choice, but when they are planning to become pregnant or in the first trimester of pregnancy, we give them propyl thioyuracil instead of methimazole because it less readily crosses placenta. And methimazole being a teratogenic drug, we avoid methimazole when they are planning for pregnancy and the first trimester. But propylthyroxine is more hepatotoxic with other toxic features and thereby second and third trimester we switch over to methimazole. Again during lactation, propylthyroxine is less uh, transported through the breast milk and thereby we prefer propylthyroxine when they are lactating. So in the first trimester and lactation, propylthyroxine is preferred. Second and third trimester, we go back to methimazole. When we are treating hyperthyroid, we have to be very, very careful. We should not treat them in excess. Then they become hypothyroid. Fetal hypothyroidism is very, very common when the mother is treated for hyperthyroid. So it's always better to keep the mother a little bit on the hyperthyroid state <coughs> to avoid the fetal hypothyroidism. So we keep monitoring the fetus in various ways just to make sure the baby is not going into hyperthyroidism. Radioactive iodine ablation which is given for other person apart from the pregnancy period is not <coughs> given during pregnancy as is contraindicated for hyperthyroidism. Postpartum thyroiditis, we have already seen a few things about it and they are associated with thyroid peroxidase antibody. It is transient thyroid dysfunction during the first six months postpartum, most commonly at three months. Type 1 diabetes patient, family history of autoimmunity, and previous postpartum episodes are high risk patients that they will get it again this time. TSH thereby are measured at third and six month postpartum. Early miscarriage previously also can trigger a postpartum thyroiditis. They, they go through a transit hyperthyroidism, then hypothyroid, and then become thyroid. Antithyroid drugs generally not indicated during this period, and as I told you, they Become, when they are thyroid peroxidase antibody positive, they become an overt hyperthyroid very soon, 20% every year. So follow-up with annual TSH measurement is necessary for a patient who suffers from postpartum thyroiditis. We go into the fetus and the neonate. Thyroid gland physiology in the fetus, 8 to 10 weeks, the fetus starts concentrating iodine and it synthesizes its hormone. 
12 to 14 weeks pituitary thyroid system is complete. By 20 weeks, hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis is ready and it is mature. So there is abrupt increase in fetal TSH following 20 weeks and in plateaus around 28 weeks. At term, there is fetal thyroidal hyperactivity, which we will be seeing in the next slide. T3, T4 and TSH are transported across placenta to meet the fetal thyroxin demands in first trimester. In early weeks, fetal brain is dependent on placental transport of maternal T4, which I have already told once and again. Definitely, so it's important that maternal subclinical hypothyroidism should be treated timely in the first trimester itself. So fetal thyroid hormones, as I said, from 20 weeks, it, it starts producing its TSH. T4 and RT3 are more, as I told, RT3 is a reserve hormone, which it, the reserve hormone is more in fetal blood just to face the increased metabolic requirement immediately after the delivery. Here you see <coughs> at the birth, the baby is exposed to the cool atmosphere. This immediate neonatal cooling, what happens is that thyrotrophin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus releases immediately within 30 minutes of delivery and thereby with thyrotrophin releasing hormone comes TSH and prolactin surges. Can you see that? The surge here which occurs within 30 minutes of delivery TSH and prolactin releases because of thyrotrophin releasing hormone coming in due to the neonatal cooling effect when it comes into the atmosphere, cooling atmosphere outside the mother. So, this TSH immediately increases the T4 and T3. You can see here, T4 immediately rises, T3 rises. Within 24 to 48 hours, there is surge of hormones because of the requirement for the fetus to maintain on its own. Now it's out of the mother. And slowly they all settle down over the next three to five days and next few weeks. So, this neonatal thyroid hormone surge is kept in mind for screening the neonate. Generally, the neonatal screening is done after 48 hours to avoid the surge of hormones. This slide I wanted to mainly tell you the surge of hormones which you can see here. After birth, TSH increases, T4 increases, RT3 which was high starts coming down slowly, T3 increases. All this requirement for the baby. And here you can see that between the fetal 8 weeks to 20 weeks when the fetal thyroid <coughs> formation synthesis is not ready, when it depends on the mother, that is the time when the, there is neuroblast multiplication in the brain of the baby. So if that neuroblast multiplication occurs between 8 and 20 weeks, and from 20 weeks to the early infancy and early childhood, we have glial cell multiplication, migration and myelinization, which is so important that Thyroxin hormone and iodine is given for the fetus through the mother in the beginning and even later and we keep the mother in a euthyroid state to maintain this otherwise our child is going to be retarded mentally and cognitive performance is going to be bad. So for the neurocognitive development of the fetus it is so essential that we treat the mother subclinical or clinical hypothyroidism and see that the thyroxin and iodine levels requirement are met for the mother and the baby. So neonatal screening is done after 48 hours of birth. Hypothyroidism, neonatal commonly it is associated with maternal hypothyroidism. Congenital hypothyroidism is not clinically apparent. It is only with the investigation as we can do this low T4 and high TSH which has to be made out. And as we have been seeing, major brain development occurs in the first three months of birth. So early and high dose treatment before three months of age is associated with the normal mental development. Now, finishing off pregnancy and neonate, we go into the perimenopausal period of women. Perimenopausal period, how it takes somewhere between the age of 40, 45, maybe perimenopausal, that is she's nearing menopause with a lot of hormonal changes. Everybody tells about this. I am nearing menopause, I have a lot of hormonal changes, I have a lot of problems. So we are only going to talk about atypical presentation of hypothyroid during this period. <coughs> there is abnormal uterine bleeding. It may be due to, uh, it may be due to uh, hormonal changes, gynec hormonal changes itself. 
Then we have enlarged cystic ovaries, fatigue, depression, iron deficiency, anemia, increased LDL cholesterol, pericardial effusion, a few of the things which have taken here as an atypical presentation. So when all these things are present, don't think she's perimenopausal, her hormones are going down. Please look for her, her TSH values and T4 values. And if they are abnormal, please treat them. And hypothyroidism is a strong risk factor for coronary artery disease. Hyperthyroidism in perimenopausal age, again due to various hormonal changes, leads to oligomenorrhea, chronic iron ovulation, hyperandrogenism, and the symptoms are heat intolerance, sweating, palpitation, tremor, and weight loss. And menopausal women, as it is, they have hot flushes and sweating and all this trouble. So we may think it is just menopause. No, it mimics perimenopausal transition. So please investigate them. This is very, very important. I wanted you all to listen. As we were telling, the basal metabolic rate increases in pregnancy and the requirement is more. When the lady becomes old, her metabolic rate decreases. There is decreased metabolic rate. And so the dose titration is very, very essential. 30% reduction in total dosage required. There we told in onset of pregnancy, 30% increases. Here 30% decreases. Very easy to remember. Most of the women, they take 100 micrograms of eltroxin over years together. They don't even go and see the doctor. They don't even check their TSH value. They take, take, take. So they go in for over treatment. They receive excess thyroxine. They can have silent atrial fibrillation. Then they can have osteoporosis and fractures because there is decreased estrogen and increased thyroxine. Both of them increase the resorption of bone and bone mineral density goes down. So if this women are more than 80 years, we need not treat subclinical hypothyroidism for TSH less than 10. We have to just observe them, monitor them. Only if they are symptomatic, they may need them. So I, I wanted to tell this one again. There is decrease in basal metabolic rate in elderly women. Please investigate and reduce the dosage. Sometimes they would not, they would have been receiving it for many years. So practically what is recommended is you stop the thyroid medication for about two months. Allow the thyroid axis to come back to it, stabilize it. After two months, check the T4 and TSH and again give the treatment. If you are not able to reduce it, that they are not regular. If they are over the years they have been taking, stop the medication totally. Wait for two months and then check the TSH T4 and give the medication as per required. Hyperthyroidism in postmenopausal women, sometimes when they were already on, as I told you, uh, because of the increased thyroxine, atrial fibrillation, they usually are uh, affecting systems than the whole body system. So cardiovascular system, very commonly affected, atrial fibrillation occurs in 40% of them. And there is one syndrome called apathetic, apathetic hyperthyroidism, where there is triad of weight loss, constipation and loss of weight. And usually mixed leads thinking that it's GI malignancy with all the symptoms. They are failure, when any old woman, failure to try, you're not able to diagnose her problem. She's having something, no structural problems, no. Then please check her thyroid values. Maybe she is having hyperthyroidism. So there should be a high index of suspicion in any age group. We should be ready to screen your preconceptional women, your pregnant women. Elderly women, when they are symptomatic, and when they are asymptomatic, when they are more than 35 years, every 5 years we have to check their TSH values, like any other test which we do. And when they are more than 60 years, every 2 years we have to check their TSH values, just to make sure they are not having any problem with treatment. So we have an in utero fetus, we have an infant, we have a child, we have an adolescent, we have a reproductive age group, postmenopausal and menopausal women. All these women are there with us. It is our duty to take care of them, timely diagnosis and treatment so that the journey of life is pleasant and good. Thank you.
more issues because I know the things. Any questions, Anand? No, no, no questions. Thank you for a very wonderful and terrific talk. So in uh, this forum section, the questions are not allowed in consideration. Next time, please. So move on to the